Hello, this is Aaron, and welcome back to the podcast. Thanks to all of you who have left a rating on Apple Podcast or the platform where you listen. If you haven't done so, I'll once again ask you, please do leave a rating or review because it helps with discoverability. So thank you very much for that. And if you're not on my newsletter, go to aaronren.substack.com and sign up today so that you don't miss anything. This week or last week, Michael Anton of the Claremont Institute, whom you may know from his famous Flight 93 election from the 2016 election cycle, wrote an interesting article calling on conservative funders to fund culture. Uh, I will put a link to the article in the show notes so you can look at it. And he was talking about the career of Tom Wolfe, who was a conservative of sorts, although he disclaimed the label. I think it's notable that really top-tier creative talent, artistic talent that tends to have conservative insights and generally avoids associating uh, with anything like uh, official political conservatism. Uh, maybe associating is too strong a word because Tom Wolfe would associate with them, but he wouldn't specifically say, I'm part of that group. That's something you could potentially think about there. But he's like, guy like Tom Wolf went out into the world and did all this interesting new journalism that was sort of mind-blowing at the time and still relevant today. Anything Tom Wolf wrote is great, uh, and you should check it out. And his point was, we need conservative funders to be willing to fund people to do stuff like that. So Anton talked about a project that he had in mind uh, earlier in his career where he wanted to go to Berkeley and sort of do a new journalism type look at Berkeley. Let's go there and write about the crazy things that are happening in Berkeley. Uh, so that was his pitch. And it is true that to some extent, uh, there isn't great funding for conservative culture making, but it gets to a bigger challenge that I see, something that I observed years ago, I have continued to sort of mention over the years, which is that conservative institutions and funders are really not interested in any sort of primary or ethnographic research. So what do I mean by primary research? Now, maybe there's a technical term for that, which I'm not, you think I'm not a scientist, I'm not an academic, I've never claimed to be one, uh, but I think of a few things that I would qualify as primary research. One of them might be building a particle accelerator and looking for some new particles uh, that predicted by some subatomic theory. That might be one. You could think of a historian who publishes uh, some research or a book based on a lot of time spent looking through old archives and old documents to determine, for example, what happened during a negotiation in a particular war. Or you can think about maybe an economist who develops a new theory of international trade and does a lot of empirical validation of that and publishes it in order to get out there. There are many, many possible things we could think of as original research, primary research. I would even include things that are non-scientific in that. Certain forms of journalism are what I call primary uh, research. So if you are the city hall reporter and you're down at the city council meeting, taking notes, doing interviews, reading the documents. If you're on the scene documenting what is happening, you're doing a form of primary research. So that's what I mean by primary research. What I mean by ethnographic research, so ethnography is essentially the study of cultures. And so when you're doing ethnography, you often go into a particular culture and your goal is to understand that culture on its own terms and to essentially come up with, call it a value-free, you know, portrait of that. So I'm going into, you know, a particular tribe uh, in a jungle and I'm seeking to understand, you know, their, their social systems or whatever. Or it could be I'm going into a church and I'm trying to just understand the culture of that church and those people. I'm not trying to apply judgments. I'm trying to understand them from their self-conception, maybe from their own, and be more descriptive. 
uh, about it. But it's essentially the study of people groups and cultures, uh, et cetera. And again, conservatives basically don't do this. And some people would push back and say, well, maybe the problem, Aaron, is that conservatives are excluded from academia. If you're an academic and you're someone who aspires to be an academic and you're a conservative, you're probably not going to get that tenured professorship that would allow you to do that kind of research. And there's some truth in that. It's also true that there are a large number of conservative think tanks that spend a lot of money every year. I've heard as much as a billion. Uh, that seems high, but certainly hundreds of millions combined. They employ a lot of Ivy League PhDs. They could be doing some of this, uh, but I don't see it. You know, what I see, and again, some of this is the nature of the think tank business, is it's very policy-oriented research. So here we're going to churn out another paper talking about how charter schools really do perform well and benefit their students. Or here is the child tax credit that we need to pass. So a lot of the research is that kind of policy-based document. Other think tanks, non-conservative think tanks, sometimes do create what I would call primary research. The Brookings Institution uh, does... Uh, I don't know if it's, it's per se primary research, but they create original data sets that they seek to have be leveraged by other people in their own research. So they did one on international trade where they did some surveys of you know exports from metropolitan areas. And I think there was more than just essentially downloading the federal data and sort of massaging it and then you know putting it in a nice graph in a report. They actually did some you know, original estimating and original, you know, calculations and things of that nature. So conservatives tend not to do that sort of original research. They tend not to do that kind of ethnographic research. They do primarily secondary research. And who's an example of someone who does that? Why, that would be me. <laughs> I, what do I do? I typically rely on newspapers or other media outlets to report the facts of events, I rely on government agencies to collect statistics, and I take those documents that they've produced. I take, you know, the accounts of something that happened in the newspaper, and I analyze that and put some frameworks around it, maybe put some opinion on it. You know, primarily you would say I'm an opinion journalist, I guess you would say, and then I put out my kind of point of view on it. But I'm relying on other people to create the underlying fact sets primarily that I do. Now, that's not always the case. I do do some things that you might consider, you know, primary research at some level. If I do a very detailed analysis of a book, that's a form, I guess, of, of primary research. But it, it hasn't been, you know, my kind of specialty. Nor am I really a, a shoe leather reporter. I do some reported pieces. In fact, I might be doing some reported pieces here pretty soon. But I don't really like to do that. I'm not trained as a journalist. And particularly when it gets into sort of what's the political dynamic behind a particular piece of legislation. You have to do a lot of interviews. You have to do a lot of sorting through what really happened. How do you weigh what this person said what that versus what that person says to get at the underlying facts. And I just don't have a lot of training or experience uh, in that. So I tend to do like, you know, features on a particular building or something where there's not a lot of controversy around what the actual facts are. You know, it's not a he said, she said sorts of things. And, uh, you know, I can get color commentary from people involved. And so I, I do some of that, but it's not my, my main focus. And the fact that conservatives don't do this sort of primary or ethnographic research or really hobbles them because everything that they build upon is created by the left. And the left does research that frames narratives very powerfully. One example that I gave is, um, I think it's Matthew Desmond. I don't remember his name off the top of my head. I, I should have done that. Uh, but he wrote the book Evicted. So he was doing his PhD research and he decided to do his dissertation on evictions in Milwaukee. So he studied the eviction process. He did, you know, data collection on evictions. He also visited 
uh, you, you know, eviction court, saw what happened there, and he did ethnographic research in which he went into these communities and lived with and understood what was going on with people who were uh, being evicted and were at risk of eviction, as well as the landlords who owned some of these buildings. And he did this research. And then later he turned it into a book. And his book and his opinion pieces since then have leveraged his research in order to create a certain narrative uh, around eviction that is very, you know, leftist friendly, let's just say, because he's definitely on the left. And a lot of conservatives wrote reviews of that book, and so they had some different perspectives. Uh, one of them was from a former colleague of mine who I thought made a really great point, which is that um, this guy did not talk to the neighbors of the people who were being evicted. They talked to the, the, the tenant, talked to the landlord, but didn't talk to the neighbors. What do the neighbors think about what's going on with these properties and about what's going on with these tenants? How is that affecting other people in the neighborhood, that would have been an interesting piece of research. But the fact is, conservatives didn't actually do it, did they? <laughs> no, they didn't. Instead, what did they do? <laughs> they just wrote reviews of this guy's book. And there are a lot of conservatives who write about housing policy. It's almost all about yimbyism. If you're not familiar with yimbyism, yimbyism means yes in my backyard, sort of a, a play on the term nimby for not in my backyard. A nimby is someone who's opposing some form of development that would happen in their neighborhood, opposing the new retail center down at the corner or something, or a new housing development next door. Uh, so they're like, Yimby, we need to build more. And so there's tons and tons and tons of agitation around housing markets there. But nobody ever did anything on evictions, which I think is very interesting. But before Desmond did this research, basically, this was an unstudied area. Nobody had ever really systematically studied evictions before. This was a white space opportunity. And it was one where conservatives could have come in and essentially owned the field, made legitimately valuable research contributions. Not just the opinion on what to do, but really setting the findings that shape how other people think about it. You know, when you're kind of first to market, that can be very powerful. Uh, in a lot of ways, uh, but hasn't been done. Another one, there was a book that was written, uh, came out last year called American Made, uh, What Happens to People When Work Disappears? Uh, so that's a, a play on a title called When Work Disappears by William Julius Wilson. Uh, and this book was written by Farrah Stockman, and she's a reporter for the New York Times. And when Trump was elected in 2016, you may recall that there were some big controversies about a carrier plant in Indianapolis that was moving to Mexico. And he's like, well, you're not moving to Mexico. We're not doing that. We're going to tariff the crap out of you if you do. And so, you know, Trump even went there. And you can read to understand more about this kerfuffle. Uh, but a lot of media were looking into the carrier situation in Indianapolis. And there was another plant at the same time that Trump also uh, opined upon that was also moving to Mexico called Rexnord. It was a bearing plant. And Stockman went to do reporting on, I think primarily Rexnord. She may have also did work on carrier, uh, but she did reporting on this as part of her coverage of, you know, Trump. And she decided, hey, wait a minute, this is a very interesting story. And so she decided to write a book about the people who worked in the Rex Nord bearing plant. And she covered three people, a guy named Wally, uh, a woman named Shannon, uh, and a, a man named John. So Wally was a black man, uh, Shannon was a, a white woman, and, and John was a white man, kind of from Appalachia. Three different people who worked there, tells their life stories, talks about the history of the plant, talks about what they went through with the plant closures, talked about what happened to them afterwards. It's a really compelling story, to be quite honest. And I thought as I was reading this, and I wrote this up in my review, uh, so I will post a link to my review at American Compass of this book, I said to myself, who is the biggest voting block uh, in the Republican Party, and if not the biggest, certainly one of the biggest, most important voting blocks. Well, it's the white working class. It's non-college degreed whites who work in factories and things like that. When's the last time you saw a really detailed exposition 
by a conservative of the life of people in these plants or the communities in which these people live, you frankly don't see it. Why was it a liberal New York Times reporter who wrote this book about the people in the plant and not a conservative who wrote the book about the people in the plant? It makes me think like the conservative elites, the Republican Party, has very little interest in the actual people who vote for them. It just doesn't even seem to, to compute. Uh, another book that I've uh, spoken highly of before is called Glass House by Brian Alexander. It's a look at a town called Lancaster, Ohio, southeast of uh, Columbus, where there was a glass plant called Anchor Hocking, and they tell the story of that town and that glass plant through the lens of private equity machinations as it's bought and sold multiple times and what's going through. Again, very compelling story, talking about a story that's happened in many, many, many places in Variety, but it's written by a very liberal guy. And again, both Brian Alexander and Farrah Stockman are really good journalists and really good storytellers, and as a result, like all good art, like all good uh, reporting, it actually sorts of overflows the narratives of their own politics in some important ways. So in the case of Brian Alexander, when I read his book, he made many points that he didn't call out directly or necessarily explicitly, although in some cases he did, that really made maybe some more conservative points. So one of the things he talked about was how Back in the day, the social infrastructure of Lancaster, Ohio, was sustained by stay-at-home moms who basically were full-time community-building volunteers, and that that is now gone. And that's one reason there is so little social capital uh, left in the town. So the loss uh, of essentially that group of people had profound impacts uh, on the community. Another is his, you know, discussion of immigration. He really doesn't talk about immigration all that much. You know, if you read an, a newspaper, uh, they're always talking about how immigrants are going to save us. Well, in his telling, there aren't a huge number of immigrants uh, that he speaks of in uh, Lancaster. But whenever we hear uh, about you know, people who aren't from the United States, it's often drug dealing or other issues. Uh, we don't see any evidence of immigrants saving that town. And we actually see uh, some evidence of how immigrants have created challenges in that town. And again, he doesn't really explicitly say anything, but just his honest reporting of what's happened allows you to see for yourself facts that aren't there. One of the things that I wrote in my review of Stockman's book is kind of a lens that's missing, you know, from hers uh, that I could see it, it was there was this one guy, John, ended up doing much better than the other, the other two did uh, after the plant closed. And, you know, she attributes some of that to kind of white male privilege, obviously, but I said, look, John was the only person who had an intact family. <laughs> he had gone through two, you know, kind of financial catastrophes with the closure of his previous employer and with the closure of Rexnord. And that could have caused his family to collapse, could have caused his wife to divorce him. Instead, they had an intact family, no stepkids, no parades of girlfriends, nothing. And that intact family helped them navigate it through. She also makes many points about how basically education doesn't help these people. You know, John got an associate's degree, didn't help him. You know, we see the jobs actually are moving to Mexico. You know, this, like, this is not an illusion. These jobs are moving to Mexico. She, she makes many, many points uh, that are, uh, you, you know, based in like just good reporting. It's not an agenda, but it lets us draw and challenge some of the narratives. She herself even points out, hey, the feminist agenda is for women like me. You know, the immigrant agenda is for women like me. I need my Mexican au pair so that I can be out doing work like this that's highly rewarding, highly fulfilling, making money. You know, for these women who work in these factories, you know, immigration is competition and all these things that they, you know, that, that are here to benefit us, you know, kind of upper class women doesn't really help them at all. You know, they get an entirely different set of needs that are not even being addressed by upscale feminism. So she makes a lot of interesting points there. And this is where I would go back to uh, someone like Anton's piece and say what makes great reporting, great culture, great art is that it isn't an agenda-driven art. It isn't agenda-driven research. It isn't agenda-driven reporting. You know, when Tom Wolfe 
went out into the world. He made many conservative observations, but he was first and foremost an extremely keen observer of what was really there. And you have to have that open mindset. You can't just go to Berkeley and say, I'm going to write about the crazy things going on in Berkeley. You have to go to Berkeley. Maybe the crazy things that you hear about are what attract you, but you have to say, let's see what's happening in Berkeley. Let's see what's going on. Let's see what's true. Let's see what's real and tell that story. And that's what makes for something that's really compelling. And I do find it interesting that conservatives tend not to do that. One, they, conservatism tends to attract opinion journalists such as myself. I mean, like, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm some great researcher who couldn't raise money from these guys or something like that. It tends to attract people who are very good at writing op-eds, millions of op-eds written by this. I mean, conservatism could, in fact, be viewed primarily as a journalistic enterprise, primarily based in opinion journalism. Not a lot of reporting, uh, not a lot of, you know, high-quality original research, not a lot of filmmaking, not a lot of things like that. So I think there's, you know, there's on the one side, the profile of person, the talent who's attracted into this field are not people who are by and large interested in doing that kind of research. And the other hand, the institutions and the funders, you know, are more interested in, you know, promoting school choice or, you know, keeping the carried interest tax deduction or talking about tax credits or talking about foreign policy, all good things, by the way, to talk about. I'm not saying that we shouldn't talk about those, but it's not, you know, doing this kind of initial research that sets the agenda uh, it's just not part of it. And that really puts you at a huge disadvantage because somebody who really has come in and really actually does know a lot more about the topic than you do is able to frame it in a powerful way. And I'll give one example of conservative original research that actually did have this effect. And it's uh, this is a little meta, but it is the history of conservatism itself. The first real intellectual history uh, of conservatism was written by a guy, I think his name was John Nash, last name was for sure Nash. It was called The Conservative Intellectual Movement Since 1945. And Nash was a conservative historian, so he was part of the movement, but he wrote this story and it essentially became the base off which all future histories of conservatism, writing about conservatism, understood the movement. Among other things, he's the one that created the three-legged stool concept, which was the three-legged stool was kind of libertarian or classically liberal economics, traditionalism, and anti-communism. So he's dividing into the three-legged stool. And many of these concepts became essentially the central organizing principle through which conservatism was understood. Now, a few people in the last couple of decades have sort of tried to critique that, but even most of the academics who have different points of view recognize, hey, this guy actually did do good work. He did quality history, and yeah, we can come back and try to you know do things differently, but at its base, this guy did a really good book that actually presented a lot of very accurate material in a very compelling way, and it set the agenda for how things were perceived uh, for a very long period of time. And so uh, I think there's there's a multi-dimensional challenge here. Uh, yes, there's a funding challenge. Uh, yes, there's an institutional challenge, which I think Anton is not particularly interested in solving the institutional challenge. I think he's looking more for rich people to uh, become patrons uh, of today's uh, Tom Wolf's, uh, which course I, I think could could be very good, would be great. Uh, it would be great to have some billionaires, you know, become a patron of me, for example. I, I'd love that. But what I would say is there's also a, cha a challenge on the talent side. Because if you want to do primary research, if you want to do yeah, kind of ethnography, if you want to do uh, new journalism type on the ground reporting, yes, it's expensive. There's no two ways about it. It's expensive. I'm constantly telling people if you want to do like really high quality art, if you want to do really high quality writing and reporting, it's expensive and it's time consuming. Uh, I go back to this Playboy interview with Jimmy Carter. 
which you can buy in many of the Playboy interviews uh, on Amazon Kindle. They're like 99 cents a piece, and there's also various collections. There's no dirty pictures, so you have to worry about that, but they interviewed a lot of famous people. The guy who wrote the famous Jimmy Carter Playboy interview from you know, November 1976 with Jimmy Carter, he spent four months following Jimmy Carter around on the campaign trail and did multiple, multiple, multiple interviews with him before he finally edited it all together into this sketch. And so you can't underestimate the amount of money that it takes to do something that is really good and the amount of effort that it takes to do research. And I think the good news is there is plenty of money. I don't know if you saw, but there was just this uh, new ad campaign that a Christian group uh, you know, put together. They were doing you know, things in Times Square. They're doing social media, and it's not necessarily intended to be evangelistic, but maybe sort of pre-evangelistic. Uh, if I find a, a link to it, maybe I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes. But it's a $100 million ad campaign. <laughs> so uh, research is expensive, but it's not $100 million expensive unless you're doing like particle physics or something like that. So that amount of money could have funded an incredible amount uh, of journalism and, and research. Uh, and so not to discount that ad campaigns might be valuable, but what I think it shows is there actually are the financial resources available to do these things uh, if some of that money is directed in the right direction. Uh, but also, there has to be somebody to direct it to. There has to be somebody who's uh, ready and willing uh, to do that kind of work at the highest quality level, like a Tom Wolf. Because if you don't have that, if you're just funding, you know, whatever, uh, it's not going to work. And this is one thing that I would just back up. There's a, it's a very uh, common complaint today. Conservatives missed on culture. They didn't do culture. They should have done culture. Uh, it really bothers me when people on the Internet suggest that they're the first person that's ever thought of a particular problem. If you go back to my, one of my very first um, masculinist is issues. It was maybe it was newsletter number three. One of the things I did is I said I am far from the first person to talk about the challenges facing men in the church. I mean, there's been whole movements like muscular Christianity uh, that were focused on this, and you can go through the Boy Scouts on down the line. I mean, people have talked about this for years. If if you think, Darren, that you're the first guy who ever thought about this problem, if some of these things, like this is an insight that like you're the first person to ever have, it, that's nuts. And so I think there has been a lot of thinking about culture in the in the past. The problem that a lot of people, again, don't want to acknowledge is that the cultural products that were produced were no good <laughs> and not positioned to really uh, uh, do all that great. If you go to James Davison Hunter's book, To Change the World, James Davison Hunter talks about this vast Christian publishing industry of all the stuff that goes out. Think about the Christian media industry. Think about contemporary Christian music. Think about any sort of Christian uh, media. It's mostly not that good. Let's be honest. It's light rock with some Jesus-y lyrics in it. And I kind of like the light rock genre. To be honest, I used to listen to, you know, kind of light rock love songs in college when I was studying, things like that. Uh, on the rare times that I did study. But, you know, this is not like high art. You know, the Left Behind books, 60 million copies. You know, we're producing a lot of that, okay? There's a lot of culture that's been produced. You know, you can go, well, there are Christian movies being produced today. So there, there has been, quote, unquote, conservative culture. But it just hasn't necessarily been, you know, that great. <laughs> so part of it is that you actually have to do good culture. If you're doing, if you're a Tom Wolf, yeah, that's awesome, right? If you're David Mamet, yeah, that's awesome. But you actually have to have the talent that's capable of executing at a high level with a mission not to go out and own the libs, not to prove that charter schools are awesome, but maybe to go into a charter school and find some incredible story or some incredible fact that you know, nobody ever did, that might contradict what you thought in some ways, but eliminates the problem in a different ways. If you're not interested in the truth, uh, if you're not interested in a, a creative vision that transcends just politics, uh, then you are what, what Tom Wolfe criticized in the modern art uh, movement. He called it the painted word, that basically modern art started with a theory and then created art that embodied the theory. And, you know, he thought that was, was quite bad. Uh, we can debate 
But nevertheless, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing that you can fall into and it sort of makes things a little inferior. I think the other thing that conservatives need to take stock of in the art world is that they have by and large rejected the modern. And you see this very clearly in architecture. The average conservative person uh, thinks of architecture in the way that, say, this Twitter account Wrath of Non does. It's all these traditional villages, or it's neoclassical, uh, et cetera. Uh, the guy, uh, Myron Magnet, used to be the editor of City Journal, still editor-at-large of City Journal. He was always very curmudgeonly about modern architecture, and he really supported classical architecture. And back when they were trying to decide what to do about Lincoln Center because it needed like a billion dollars in repair, his plan for Lincoln Center was to demolish it and rebuild it in a neoclassical style. And I like classicism, but Lincoln Center is actually a fine example of a, of a mid-century modern architectural design. The Metropolitan Opera House is one of the most iconic opera houses in the world. It's actually a great building. I have a lot of problems with a lot of contemporary art, but there are phenomenal new modern buildings being built around the world. There are even buildings in that mid-century international style that are quite good. Yes, there's a lot of pay limitations that are terrible, but when you essentially say, you know, the high watermark of art happened in, you know, in the late 1900s, and anything that's new, anything that's innovative, anything that's not like essentially a retro style, well, you're probably not going to be considered a great artist. I had an interview with a you know very conservative Christian artist, Arthur Kwan Lee. You know he's had solo gallery ex exhibitions in New York, all these things. Go look at my interview with him. Uh, watch the YouTube version, or just Google him and look at his art. His art is powerful, but his art is not some retro pastiche, all right? So when you want to do art, when you want to do culture, when you want to do these things, and your whole idea is everything was better before all this modern and new stuff came along, you're probably not going to be all that good. You know, so I think there's, you know, a, a bunch of guys in tweed jackets and bow ties, you know, smoking pipes, uh, you know, talking about, you know, quaint villages. And again, that's something of a caricature, but that is, you know, sort of got some truth into it too about how conservatives think about the world culturally. Uh, let's go back to the past. Let's think about all these things. We're not going back to the past. And so the rejection of modernism, the rejection of the new, is something that conservatives need to grapple with. And that's where someone like James Burnham, I did my newsletter on the managerial revolution. James Burnham, coming out of a Marxist background, you know, did not rep, you know, reject the modern. And he was able to see thus the way that modern technological and industrial society had transformed the nature of power in society. And, and he's like, well, this is what it's going to be. We're not going back to the New England township that Tocqueville wrote about and, you know, have little select men that self-govern. that. We're just not going to do that because the world has moved on. We're different. So we need to be thinking on the leading edge of technology. We need to be thinking about things that are new and interesting. If we're not interested in something like that, then essentially I think we're going to just really be uh, uh, difficult in the culture world, world as well to make any progress. This is just going to look like a retro pastiche. It looks like a retro pastiche. There's this town here in Indi Indianapolis called Carmel, a very affluent suburb of 100,000 people. They do all kinds of great development, but the main knock on them is all their architecture is like retro pastiche. And... It's very kind of, you know, Disney celebration of Florida type thing. It, it just doesn't look organic, authentic, because it's an intentional recreation of a retro style, often very tastefully done. I love the community. But when you adopt that sort of retro aesthetic, there you are. Tom Wolf was actually innovative in the way that he did journalism. And so I think we need to think about uh, not just funding it, not just quality, uh, but also thinking about you know, what does it mean to actually embrace the modern and the new and to move forward? Um, not that I say we need to be a total rejection of the past. Not that we there aren't things that we, we need to, to value from the past. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but I think most notably that you see it in architecture, the re in, in an art, the rejection of the modern, the rejection of the new, 
um, is a mistake because a lot of it is actually quite good. There are a lot of you know modern pieces of art, a lot of modern advertising and posters from the mid-century era, uh, for example, a lot of buildings being built today. Uh, there are great things being done in the graphic design space, in the architectural space, uh, that people love and resonate and are actually good. And so if you, I think that's a challenge that uh, conservatives need to uh, uh, cultivate as well. So I do think there's a, there's a sort of a selection problem, uh, right? And that who gets selected into being a conservative? Well, you know, people who are, again, I've talked about the problems of elites, that conservatism, evangelicalism is, you know, kind of a middle-class subaltern community. Uh, it's, has no concept of being an elite. It has no concept of institutional leadership and using authority in order to shape society and its institutions to uh, create uh, the public good, uh, at, you know, and go forward into a next generation. And th these sort of mentalities are very crippling. It's very easy to look at what is wrong with people on the left and critique them all day long. And owning the libs is like the best thing that, that conservatives love to do. But you got to know yourself first. You have to take a look in the mirror and say, what am I getting wrong? What are we getting wrong? Where are we not getting it right? And so, like Dan Tan's piece, I do think there's uh, missing pieces on culture. There needs to be more funding of culture. There needs to be more funding of primary research and ethnography and journalism at a powerful level. Uh, but there also needs to be, you know, there's also a challenge, talent challenge. We need to have the talent uh, be deployed in that era and move away from the op-eds uh, at some level. And again, Aaron, are you going to do that? You know, probably not. You know, maybe I would in some way. There actually are research projects that I would like to take on. I don't know that right now it would be wise for me to shut down what I'm doing, you know, in order to go back to grad school and study things that I'm very interested in. Uh, but who knows, uh, one day when, you know, I'm, I've gotten over the hump on some of the things that we're doing uh, here and we've... Uh, really helped move the needle on helping church uh, and, you know, kind of conservative American Christians, you know, adapt to the 21st century. Maybe I'll have the, the leisure uh, to be able to go uh, and do some of that stuff. Uh, so, and I'm working on hopefully what's going to be some really killer uh, cultural content with new founding through, through, through the men's lifestyle stuff. So I am a little bit engaged on it, but, you know, I also, I don't exclude myself from the look in the mirror uh, thing. So, Want to talk about culture? Read Michael Anton's article. Read my review of Ferris Stockman's book, and I will talk to you next week.